Good morning, Kenny students. It's me, Caroline, and I'm here with the results from last week and the new books. So last week's book read on Friday, The Panda Problem, read by Nathan Pichardo, won. And now this week's new, today's new books are The Marvelous Thing That Came From a Spring, read by Hazel Kalisa versus Gilbert the Great, read by Darnell Bias. Hi, my name is Richard, and I'm the slinky inventor, and my friend Hazel will be reading you my story. Hi, my name is Hazel Kalisa, and this is The Marvelous Thing That Came From a Spring by Gilbert Ford. Richard James was a dreamer, but in 1943, the United States was at war. Richard had to support his country and his family. So he worked as an engineer for the United States Navy in a shipyard in Philadelphia. His assignment was to invent a device that could keep fragile ship equipment from vibrating in choppy seas. Richard tried all kinds of springs, but nothing was working. Then one day, a torsion spring fell from the shelf above his desk. It, its coils took a walk. And and so did Richard's imagination. This spring might not work for the Navy ships, but Richard knew he had stumbled onto something. What was it? After work, Richard rushed home and showed his wife, Betty, the floppy spring. They gave the spring to their son, Tom, who let it go from the top of the stairs. The family watched in astonishment as it walked all the way down. I think it's a toy, Richard marveled. Betty thought so too. She also thought that if they wanted to share their discovery with the world, they needed to figure out what on earth to call this thing. Betty thumbed through a dictionary for two days, underlining words. Nothing sounded quite right until she found slinky, meaning graceful and curvy in movement. Slinky also sounded like the swish and clink of the spring's coils in motion. It was only a name, but it was just right. With one word, Betty thought she could transform this spring. Richard and Betty wanted to produce a lot of slinky, but they did not have the money to do it. So Richard sprang to the bank and took out a $500 loan to have 400 slinkies made. Once they arrived, Richard brought his invention to every toy store in Philadelphia, but no one wanted it. Was the Jameis's idea a flop? Finally, he tried a large department store called Jim Bell's. Jim Bell's showed as little interest in the toy as the other stores, but Richard begged the manager to allow him to demonstrate how it worked to the holiday shoppers just once. And so, on a stormy night in November 1945, with Christmas just weeks away, shoppers poured into Jim Bills. They were searching for the next great stocking stu stuffer, and Richard was ready. He, he placed the coil at the top of the ramp he had built and scanned the store for Betty. Where was she? Betty was still pacing back and forth at home. She was afraid no one would want the toy. Just in case, she asked her friend to pose as an excited shopper and gave her a dollar to buy one. Richard was unable to wait any longer, so he took a deep breath. Could you pass? Betty was still pacing back and forth at home. She was afraid no one would want the toy. 
Just in case, she asked her friend to pose as an excited shopper and gave her a dollar to buy one. But Richard wasn't able to wait any longer, so he, he took a dip, deep breath and let the slinky go. When Betty finally arrived at Jim finally Bell's, arrived at Jim Bell's, there was no need to pretend to love the toy. All 400 slinkies had sold in 90 minutes. The slinky was a hit. The war ended that same year and the troops returned home to, to marry their sweethearts. A baby boom soon followed and demand for the slinky skyrocketed. So, Richard dreamed up an even bigger idea. He used his engineering skills to build a machine that could coil 80 feet of steel wire into a slinky in 10 seconds. While Richard made the slinkies and drove the delivery van, Betty kept the business running smoothly. She, fr she frantically filled orders sent and collected payments and hid their profits in a rusting pan below the basement. Soon, there was more business than the Jameses could handle by themselves. So, Richard and Betty built a factory and hired 20 people to work for them. At least they were able to spin out enough slinkies for every child in America to have one. Today, the, the slinky still inspires kids of all ages and all across the globe to play. It took the teamwork of a dreamer and a planner to turn an ordinary spring into a truly marvelous thing. The end. Hi, my name is Raymond, Gilbert's best friend, and Darnell will be reading his story. Hi, my name is Darnell Bias, and today we're going to be reading Gilbert the Great by Jane Clark and Charles Hughes. For the time, Gilbert the Great White Shark was a tiny pup. Raymond the remora stuck to him like glue. Raymond was always at Gilbert's side. When Gilbert was stuck in the seaweed, Raymond tangled him. When Gilbert was got dirty, Raymond cleaned him up. And when Gilbert lost his first row of teeth, Raymond helped him collect them for the Tooth Fairy. Gilbert and Raymond had lots of fun. They loved to play finball, tide and seek, and sardines. They shared everything. Then one day, Raymond told Gilbert that his family had to move across the ocean. I don't want to go, but mom says I have to go, cried Raymond. As Raymond and his family swam away, Gilbert mother hugged him tight and tried to comfort him. Raymond's my best friend, said Gilbert. Why did he have to go away? It's not fair. I know, said mom, but his family couldn't just leave him behind. She kissed Gilbert on the snout. Go and play tide and seek with the pilot fish. It will keep your mind off Raymond, but Gilbert couldn't stop thinking about his friend. 
I want to move with Raymond, Gilbert said. He's moved too far away, said Mom. We have to stay here. Let's go watch the basketball game. The Thrashing Threshers are playing the title Tigers. Who do you want to win? Gilbert looked around. There were, were remorse everywhere, but no, none of them was Raymond. I don't care, he said. He swam off before either side scored a basket. The next day at school, everyone was very kind to Gilbert. They even gave him an extra long turn on the seesaw. Cheer up, said Marvin the Mallet. There are plenty of fish in the sea. There isn't another Raymond, said Gilbert. Gilbert was, was still sulking when mom came to collect him from school. It's not the same without Raymond, said, without Raymond, Gilbert pouted. The night Gilbert cried and cried and cried and his warm tears mingled with the cold ocean water. The next morning, Mom took Gilbert gently by the fin and towed him into shallow water. Rocked by the gentle waves, they gazed out at the seashore and the bright blue sky. I hope Raymond's new home is as nice as this, said Gilbert. I'm sure it is, said Mom. I'm hungry, Gilbert said suddenly. We'll go to the wreck, said Mom. Gilbert's eyes lit up. They didn't usually go to the wreck. Mom didn't like him eating junk food. Scrunch, munch, crunch. As Gilbert was b biting into a pile of tin cans and bits of old boat, he spotted a small remora crying in the shadows. Gilbert stopped crunching and swam towards her. What's the matter, Gilbert asked. Mom and I moved and I had to leave my shark behind, she sobbed. Now I don't have any friends. My remora had to move, to move too, said Gilbert sadly. I'm so lonely. Gilbert and the remora looked at each other and smiled, wobbly smiles. I'm Gilbert, said Gilbert. I'm Rita, replied the remora. Just then a ray of sunlight filtered through the deep blue ocean. Gilbert's teeth flashed as he grinned a huge grin. Do you want to play finball with me, Rita? He asked. Sunlight danced in Rita's eyes. I love to, she said. And the two new friends swam off to find a ball to play with. The end.